Hello, I'm Sam from Sound on Sound magazine. I'm here at the AES convention in New York City. And one of the great things about the AES convention is it's not just a trade show where you can look at all the latest and greatest new products. It also brings together some of the most important designers and engineers in our business. And I've taken the opportunity to get together three of the people I consider the most significant microphone designers uh, in the world today. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Mark Fuchsman of Samar Audio. Good morning. Kelly Kay and David Josephson of Josephson Engineering. Thank you. So I wanted to grill these guys a little bit about microphone technology, where it might be going in the future, what are the problems that are still to be overcome, that sort of thing. So I think there's a fairly widespread perception in the industry and certainly among consumers that microphones is sort of a mature technology, really. And it's... If you look at product launches in the microphone sector, a lot of them are very closely based on recreating old designs from the likes of Neumann and AKG. Do you think there's still room for progress in this sector? And, and what is it that's kind of holding us back and preventing that progress from being accepted? David? Well, I think progress begins with trying to understand the problem. Um, it's true that um, a pressure omnidirectional microphone, uh, the first condenser microphone, for example, invented in 1917, uh, is a pretty well understood uh, technology. And there's lots of ways of making it anywhere from uh, a nickel to thousands of dollars for different reasons. And yes, that's mature. What isn't, uh, the, the, the problem with that kind of microphone is that it picks up everything, everywhere. And so the challenge, and where I think there's a huge amount of room for improvement, is in microphones that pick up what you want and reject what you don't want. We started uh, maybe 80 years ago with directional microphones that could pick up front and back and not on the sides. And then we learned to combine those with uh, pressure microphones. But now we have more information that we want from the microphone, not only the sound, but we want to know the direction the sound is coming from. So we have arrays and complicated things. So perhaps the microphone transducer technology is mature and very much limited by physical constraints. Some people call them the laws of physics. Um, but we've just been observing, and we call it a law. Um, where there's huge room for improvement is in making the directivity more uniform and in extracting more information from the whole sound field, where the sound is coming from, uh, who's making it, how wide it is, how deep it is, all of those sorts of things. So, no, it's, you could look, you could say parts of it are mature, but there are parts of it, there's lots of room. Excellent. Well, I'm glad there's still scope for progress. And that kind of brings me on to something that I've heard Mark say before, which I've always found very interesting, because you're one of very few microphone developers who makes your own ribbon microphones and capacitor microphones. And I know that you feel quite strongly that uh, the multi-pattern microphone is a bit of a kind of ungodly compromise. And that if you want a figure eight microphone, you really ought to be using a ribbon. If you want a cardio microphone, a large diaphragm condenser is the best way to go. And if you want an omnidirectional microphone, then a small diaphragm microphone is the way to go. Maybe, could you explain a little bit about why you think that? I think any pattern is a compromise because uh, like uh, w what uh, we have only two native patterns is omni pressure and we have figure eight and whatever happens in between is just a simple mathematical uh, whether summarizing them or uh, when you extract one from another. And uh, <coughs> I think that those patterns are optimized the best uh, uh, for the uh, for getting uh, uh, the perfect uh, 
and uniform pattern. Uh, if we take figure eight, let's say ribbon microphone, it has one of the most important features. It has a very narrow ribbon and so the uniform, uh, because of that little uh, width, uh, it picks up uh, within the pattern, it picks up uh, to the very high frequencies. And I think if we take, let's say, for example, uh, even small diaphragm microphone, uh, probably uh, we are limited, of course, the size is limited to the, uh, the signal-to-noise ratio. So the smaller uh, the diaphragm diameter, the more noise we get. Uh, of course, you can get a perfect uh, omnidirectional uh, pattern, but here we are, uh, unfortunately, we are limited to the... Um, noise and it's just low physics and you cannot overcome it but in the ribbon microphone that's the beauty you can make it long and actually uh, use it to your advantage because the pattern will be uh, limited in the vertical plane and uh, the advantages, uh, for example, you have uh, floor or ceiling reflections, uh, so you can greatly eliminate it or control those with uh, correct tilt of the microphone or uh, correct miking, but the whole information within the pattern is uh, extremely uniform up to very high frequencies. When we take omnipressure, it is a stiffness controlled uh, system, so the um, pattern, uh, uh, so the uh, frequency response is uh, 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 very linear. The problem becomes when we get into a resistant control uh, system. And that, so uh, I would say this is uh, a very old technology and uh, so we need to dump uh, uh, the diaphragm to get this uniformity of uh, frequency response. And that's where the problem starts because of the back chamber, because of uh, internal resonances, because of uh, uh, the diaphragm tuned in the uh, middle of the bandwidth. So the, I mean, in a sense, the challenge of directivity is to a large extent, one of acoustics. So Kelly, if I could turn to you, I think that's your role at Josephson. Um, I mean, when we look at a lot of microphones on the market, they're basically based on very old Neumann and AKG designs in terms of how the back plates are configured and so on. I mean, how are you taking that forward at Josephson? So <clears throat> when it comes to capsules, uh, Things like proximity effect, polar pattern, sensitivity are all controlled by design parameters that are pretty well understood uh, and have been worked on for many years. Um, you're not going to be able to change that. What you have to do is look for things that people have overlooked. Uh, probably for us, the best example is basket resonances. If you look at any microphone basket that you've ever seen over your life or the history of condenser microphones, for instance, um, you might have something that's maybe that wide or that wide. You're never gonna find something that's that wide or this wide. And that corresponds to uh, standing waves that sit in the sibilance region. So it's uh, you don't really want ringing or an acoustic ring to be superimposed over that. So we identified that a lot of baskets had that sort of issue. 
maybe not necessarily on a on axis too badly, but when you start to rotate a microphone off axis and you have sidebars, you get sound bouncing back and forth. And so that was a problem that we were able to identify. You know, sometimes you hear someone say, that mic takes EQ well, that mic doesn't take EQ well. Well, if there is an acoustical resonance making, you know, a, a bump in the uh, frequency response, uh, not necessarily one that you see, but but a ringing that's superimposed with the, with the uh, response of the capsule may look okay, but if the capsule's rolling off and the basket is bumping it up, but it's bumping it up because it's doing something like this, then you're not going to be able to EQ around there nicely because if you push down a peak like this, you're never going to match it perfectly. You're probably going to, you know, in order to knock that down, come up with something wider and make a response that has a dip and then a bump and then a dip, which sounds weird. So as an example, we got rid of that problem in the basket. Um, other issues that you can look uh, at are reliability, um, consistency. Uh, if you get in a time machine and go back 40, 50, 60 years, machining techniques, materials, we're not as mature and sophisticated as we have right now. So the ability to make things that are consistent and last for a long time without changing their properties is much better. We have microphones like our C700S and A that have been out in the field for 20 years that you know may come back because someone dropped them, but if the insides haven't been damaged, we can measure them and see has it drifted over 20 years and we consistently get stuff back that hasn't changed at all over 20 years. You know, you can find much older microphones that, uh, you know, having gone maybe 40 years or whatever, don't sound at all like they originally did. And you can amass a bunch of them and find, wow, each one of these sounds different. Maybe time did that or maybe in original production, they were also somewhat different, but these days you can come up with mics that are all the same. And so also, you know, going on that point, you're able to have better control over minor things as well. So the other thing too is the electronics too. We can come up with quieter uh, microphones, better circuitry. Um, so you have to look at what's changed with the tools you have for making it the materials that you have and you know progress with that for instance with our our basket that we have to eliminate resonances in the basket it's made out of a metal foam that wouldn't have been available to people 30 or 40 years ago so that's how we we look at progressing basically what's changed what can we bump up but we're never going to be able to change the laws of physics Sam, when we were when we started talking initially before the interview, I mentioned this concept of integration, and that's what people, in focusing on the aspects of the microphone that they can readily identify, sometimes miss. They don't see what's happening behind. As we've all said, the same physics applies everywhere. It's a, a microphone for music recording or voice recording is not an analytical instrument. It's part of a tool for making content in the creative process. And the real thing that is probably always changing is just like the uh, issues that impact people building musical instruments. What choice of all of these compromises, all of these things that we've mentioned have uh, upsides and downsides and very complex interactions. Like any musical experience, it's a matter of balancing these characteristics to something that is perceived by the user as, uh, as pleasant. That's interesting. So to return to something you, s you said earlier, um, you were talking about how there's no my friends are a mature technology as far as the individual transducer is concerned, but the possibilities for development in terms of arrays and so forth. Now, one, 
at the, the parallel to the microphone has always been the loudspeaker, and there we see a lot of companies using digital signal processing to optimize loudspeakers for room environments and, and to change things like directivity and so on. Uh, we haven't yet seen an awful lot of that going on in the microphone world. Do you think that's, that's a future avenue for exploration? I don't think it's that promising. Um, in the loudspeaker world, we have a reference. We have an incoming signal that we can measure. And we can easily go out into the room and measure what's the pressure waveform that's created by the loudspeaker. And we can use the DSP to flatten things out. A marvelous tool. We don't have a connector on the back of our head to, to, to see what the, the, uh, the sound could be. Uh, there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of use of DSP in other areas of the microphone chain, for example, in modern wireless microphones that have DSP to implement uh, low latency uh, equalization that wouldn't be practical with uh, discrete analog components. So I think not in the primary path except in this case that I mentioned of uh, arrays of multiple sensors to produce a, some sort of spatial microphone pickup. That's kind of what I was thinking of. I mean, I've seen, for instance, with ambisonic microphones, people are now using beamforming to try to create very precise shotgun patterns from a multi-capsule microphone. I mean, is that something that you've explored at all? We have a lot, uh, and unfortunately, we still have the same physical constraints. Uh, we can only delay in time. We can't delay easily in phase. When we do, by breaking up the frequencies into a bunch of little bands and working on them separately, the result doesn't sound pleasant for, for, for reasons that we know from physics. That's, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a big thing. Uh, is, is it gonna sound good? Is right. it gonna be an improvement? And the thing is that, that I think it's fair for us to assume we're talking about recording studio applications um, people are going to want things to sound nice, not only on axis, but off axis. Uh, they're going to want frequency responses that are broadband and uniform, not with comb filtering as they go up in frequency. Uh, they're not going to want unwieldy things. Uh, if we're to jump into another arena like um, audio visual and we're able to install microphones in a ceiling, there's people doing amazing things with. Uh, arrays because they can make them huge. They can assume that they just carry a, care about voice and audibility uh, or intelligibility, but not fidelity so much. Uh, but if you're trying to make something that sounds really pleasing and you're competing with other people and maybe even trying to make things more like a race for the most pleasing, then uh, it's probably a losing thing to choose uh, a microphone array um, and given that those things are locked into number of microphones, spacing of microphones, overall size of the microphone array and that's just pure math, uh, I'm pretty confident that you're never going to see any significant amount of microphone arrays in the studio other than coincident arrays like uh, ambisonic A and B format microphones. And speaking also of constraints, uh, David mentioned, um, uh, the, uh, as I see, probably besides, of course, all the face problems, um, the those arrays mostly made with MEMS, uh, those very small capsules, and we have uh, a signal-to-noise uh, uh, ratio, huge problems, because there is no, as I said before, uh, here we cannot go against the physics law. The smaller the capsule, the uh, the more noise it gives. And it doesn't matter how linear you can make it. Yes, we, of course, you can make those uh, tiny capsules extremely linear across entire bandwidth, uh, like from 5 hertz up to 100k, it's not a problem. That, that, but the main problem is the noise. And you, I do not see any uh, solution to that problem. And like, uh, for example, that would be very 
uh, very uh, attractive solution, let's say, to use for array uh, bigger capsules, but high quality, uh, bigger, even Omni capsules are becoming so expensive that when we um, use them in the larger uh, arrays or uh, setups, it's just uh, not cost efficient. Interesting. And of course, yes, when you go beyond first order ambisonics and you suddenly you, you may need get into needing double figures numbers of capsules and you're summing that much noise. But your off-axis frequency response uh, and uniformity of the polar pattern uh, goes downhill rapidly. Uh, and, you know, if you think of some of the sort of highest level recordings, they're not actually multi-microphone recordings. They're symphonic things with two microphones. And the importance of your off-axis pickup uh, is incredibly high uh, and if you start to go to a higher order of polar pattern, second and third order of polar patterns, your off-axis pickup is going to be inconsistent, have phase issues, and when you combine you know, a left and right with microphones like that, stereo imaging just gets completely confused and washed out. The mathematics of, of those kinds of arrays uh, work out very nicely in an anechoic condition and at one frequency. If you have and, and in one direction, uh, and that the, the mathematics for micro, super directional microphone arrays have been under development for uh, more than 50 years, mostly in underwater acoustics. And they have a different environment and a different goal than we do. We're trying to, we have a phenomenal dynamic range in human hearing and there are people who are focusing these days on understanding human perception more analytically uh, over the 10 octaves of our hearing and 120 decibels perhaps of dynamic range uh, that's an extraordinary challenge that the array people the array mathematics is not set up to handle well, that brings me on to another topic, actually, which is um, transient response. Because um, people, it's widely thought that the bandwidth of human hearing extends perhaps from 20 hertz to roughly 20k in a good case. But there's some people claim that, in a sense, we can perceive higher frequencies than that in, in terms of transient response. And that also different microphone technologies somehow translate transients more differently to the recorded medium so people say ribbon mics have a sort of relaxed sound and condenser mics have a sort of sharper sound on the transients what's your take on that my take on that is that there is a lot of misinformation there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding of a very complex mathematical space um, some people have some hearing at very high frequencies uh, it's unclear what the brain uses it for, but there are some responses. So, yes, you can show there is some response there. Is it meaningful? That's not been shown. What has been shown is that uh, any time you uh, mess with the phase response, mess with the transient response, you cannot avoid changing the time response in mid-band, mm -hmm. slow, normal ways that everyone can hear. So it's uh, indeed transient response, the, the, the microphone grill reflection issue that Kelly was mentioning um, is, is a very strong part of that. Uh, Mark was mentioning uh, damping of, uh, of uh, condenser microphone elements. Well, ribbon microphone elements have damping too from the air cushion around them. That all moderates the transient response. It can be overdamped where the, there is a uh, uh, an excess uh, uh, dissipation of ringing energy of whatever um, whatever resonance there happens to be. It can be underdamped, which adds more of a tail to things. It's not a, it's not a simple uh, answer. Just extending the frequency response can help. It can also hurt. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add to that too. Um, a lot of people 
see promotional material addressing transient response and see, you know, drawings or images portraying, you know, a, an individual spike and then flat after it. Um, these are always in the context of an Omni. Uh, if you want to have a directional mic, you have something that's called a, a two port system. You have the front of the capsule, that's the direct sound. In order to get that polar pattern, you have uh, a delay and a difference in level for another sound to help create that pattern. And there is no getting around it. You're going to have another spike. So you're not going to have one spike if you want to have, for instance, a cardioid pattern. That said, I think it's important, uh, and we do address that actually, and this is why I wanted to jump in there because Dave didn't mention it. We, we don't want to clip those transients. So worrying about there being just one distinct one or a second one, not an issue, you need it. It's a trade-off. Do you want to have uh, a listening that really is selective over direction like a cardioid if your room is bad? I think so. And so you can tolerate that second transient spike later on and your brain is accustomed to hearing it. But do you want to clip it? Hell no. Do you want to avoid clipping it by trading off noise floor? Hell no. Um, but, um, you know, do you want to obsess over just having one spike? No, not that. And so I think that actually touches on stuff we were talking about earlier. What can you improve? Maybe you're not going to improve the capsule, but we have better electronics, not just that we can put in the microphone. For instance, in our E22S, we have a transformer that didn't really exist, what, how long, like 30 years ago, you wouldn't have been able to get it. That has very low distortion. Um, but uh, we have recording equipment now where you can actually be concerned about 24, you know, 24 bits and, you know, you know, many, many dBs of dynamic range. Whereas, you know, if you get in a time machine and all you have is a a reel-to-reel -reel tape deck that starts to roll off hard above 15k this isn't going to be an issue for you or if you're in the dark ages of low bit rate mp3 that wouldn't be an issue for you either but going forward uh, it's getting common for people to have incredibly clocked uh, you know DDAs in your cell phone some of these you know expensive high zoot cell phones have beautiful converters in them now um, so preserving dynamic range is, you know, commonly, you know, more of an issue or home, you know, home theater playback systems that, you know, have quiet dialogue and then a, a thunderstorm or a car crash comes along that causes you to jump out of your seat and reach for the volume control. So I think also I would like to add, uh, it's not only important the uh, 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 the frequency uh, how far it goes uh, frequency response but uh, i think even more important how uniform this response across entire polar pattern because you can uh, let's say if the microphone goes let's say 16k on axis but you move let's say two three five inches and uh, uh, it already uh, goes up to 5k so y that's where you get huge uh, phase anomalies and also very i think very good indicator of that when the capsule stops taking eq well Excellent. So before we wrap up, there's one further thing I wanted to ask you all about. Um, so talking about the electronics in microphones, I mean, for the last sort of, what, 50, 60 years, if you make a solid state microphone been pretty much tied to the phantom power standard, I know there are some designers who feel that's a sort of limitation that's holding back what they can do with their microphone electronics. I mean, is, are you in that camp or are you happy with phantom power? Well, um 
having pushed through an alternative phantom power specification uh, called P48H that is in the international standard now. Yes, I'm in that camp. I, I see the limitations of phantom power. Again, these are physical limitations, not of anyone's design, not, not any criticism, but if you're going to drive a cable and you need a certain um, capacitance power coming out of the, uh, the, the, that the power coming out of the microphone has to drive, then you need a certain amount of power in the microphone electronics to do that. Uh, and so um, you can supply, um, one company has a non-phantom system with uh, 130 volts. That's one approach. You can supply more current uh, in the phantom system. If the whole uh, uh, system of the preamp and the cable and the microphone are intended to operate that way. So um, in practice, in most applications, it's not an issue. Uh, for some applications, for extreme dynamic range, it certainly is. And any electronics designer uh, would like to have more power available. There are other approaches though, uh, other, other kinds of ways of sensing the microphone diaphragm uh, position or acceleration. And I think we might be seeing some of those in the next decade, uh, things that, we, that, that aren't in, in the civilian market yet. Oh, is there any more you can tell us about those? Not really. <laughs> well, I guess we'll have to wait till AES 2029 to find out more about that. But in the meantime, I hope that you found this as fascinating as I have. And it just remains for me to thank my guests, Mark Fuchsman, Kelly Kay, and David Josephson. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks.